Hello and welcome to the Dorkomotive Podcast with Brian Loans. On this episode, we're telling the unabridged history of Turbonique, the 1960s most insane speed parts manufacturer run by an ex-NASA engineer and a man who ultimately ended up on federal charges for the products that he made and sold to hot rodders across America. This is one of the wildest stories in the history of the automotive aftermarket, and we're going to tell it all right here on the Dorkomotive Podcast. Turbonique Incorporated of Orlando, Florida, is the manufacturer of a unique line of propulsion equipment. Their product line includes gas turbine engines, automotive superchargers, and thrust engines. These engines differ from more conventional designs in that they don't require air or oxygen in order to run. This is due to Turbonique's special monopropellant design. Monopropellant fuels contain all the constituents required for combustion in a single substance. Sounds like the type of stuff you need to be a rocket scientist to figure out, right? Hey, everybody, this is Brian Loans, and this is the Dorkomotive Podcast. And that voice you heard on that recording, which you'll hear again throughout the show, is explaining how a Turbonique rocket drag axle, a Turbonique auxiliary supercharger, or a Turbonique rocket thrust engine works and what it is fueled by. This is a company that manufactured these products, uh, kind of manufactured these products, and we'll get to that by the end of the story, in the 1960s, going out of business basically in 1970. So we're going to talk about this. We're going to start by telling the story of the rocket scientist, the rocket engineer that actually founded the Turbo E company. His name was Gene Middlebrooks, and all of this action takes place in Florida, and that's really no mistake because Middlebrooks, as a contractor to the U.S. government working on rocket programs, Programs like the Vanguard rocket program in the 1950s and uh, early 60s was working on developing the solid fuel rockets that would ultimately carry uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles around the world, would ultimately carry the astronauts into space. And for whatever reason, Gene Middlebrooks figured out, at least had a passing interest in the world of hot rodding. And like so many rocket propulsion engineers of this era, really felt that rockets and the technology behind rockets could cure almost all the world's ills these guys had such wild visions of what was possible by harnessing the power of rocketry the power of rocket fuels specifically and harnessing that power to turn it into whatever we really needed it to do so when we start to tell the turbonique story we have to actually go beyond turbonique's history and start with gene middlebrook's history in the late 1950s as gene middlebrook's is working as an engineer on these programs for the u.s government He's also working on side projects, as so many engineers do. In this case, for Middlebrooks, it was a battery-operated supercharger, auxiliary supercharger for cars. The benefit, of course, of an electric supercharger is that it puts no tax on the engine, so you're basically getting, quote-unquote, free horsepower. If the engine doesn't have to turn the supercharger itself or work harder to make that supercharger spin, then any additional input you get from the supercharger is effectively free, and the engine will make a ton more power. The technology, as one would imagine, in the late 1950s to actually build this thing um, was not really that great. And specifically on the powering side of this, you needed these massive batteries to actually make enough power to turn the supercharger to do anything even close to providing boost to the engine. Which, of course, you add boost, you add more fuel, you make more horsepower. So it is in the late 50s, specifically right around 1958, that Gene Middlebrooks has his first run-in with the federal authorities on mail fraud charges. The reason is he's taking deposits for this product that he is advertising in magazines, is advertising in, you know, racing trade papers and stuff across the country. He's taking deposits, and he's not really sending anything to anybody. And this will become a bit of a recurring theme in different ways for Gene Middlebrooks over the course of time. I've never seen one of these superchargers. I've never witnessed one in action. I've never actually seen anybody have a photo of one. I've never seen the brochure they were sold on. But we do know through court records that I found in research that in 1958, Middlebrooks was brought up on mail fraud charges and was actually acquitted. So um, he had a good lawyer apparently at that time. And we'll find out later on in his life he did not have quite the same legal representation. So as 1958 closes, Gene Middlebrooks, likely discouraged by his failure of the electric supercharger, begins to formulate some new ideas. And those new ideas would work their way up until about 1962 when we start to see advertising for a company based in Orlando, Florida called Turbonique. And the things that Turbonique are advertising 
are beyond the scope of anything anybody has conceived to sell the hot rodders before or since. Let's get into the product line of the Turbo Neat Company. So there were three products that Gene Middlebrooks marketed over the about half a decade lifespan of the Turbo Neat Company of Orlando, Florida. Those three products were um, thrust-driven rockets, Okay, just a pretty simple concept there. You put your rocket. We I mentioned this product briefly in an earlier podcast about Captain Jack McClure, who actually mounted a couple of these on a go-kart, went 160 miles an hour. So these were just your normal standard cruising operating or standard cruising model rocket engines that you would hit a button and whoosh, the thrust would come out, and off you go. The next two were the incredible products that were designed for cars. The first one was an auxiliary supercharger. Now remember, I mentioned in 19 in the 50s that Middlebrooks developed this battery-operated supercharger, or at least tried to. So this was his ultimate rocket-powered extension of that. Imagine, if you will, a supercharger that you bolted under the hood of your car that was powered by rocket fuel. You would hit a button. You would step on a button under the gas pedal, or you would hit a button on the dash, which would inject rocket fuel into this turbocharger-looking device that had a spark plug in it. So what would happen is the rocket fuel would enter the, the turbine, if you will. It looked like a turbo. The spark plug would go off, and it would cause this thing to turn into a mini rocket engine under the hood, which would then force air into the engine. The idea of this is so insane because it can't really be throttled. You would just stand on it, and it would throw everything it had into your engine at once. And again, in the 1950s, we're talking about cars that at most had two four-barrel carburetors on them. Some had, you know, five or six Stromberg carburetors on them or just a pair of Stromberg carburetors on them. And this thing, at the push of a button, would be sending umpteen dozens of pounds of boost, one would assume, into the engine. They used to claim that this little device made enough thrust on its own, made enough boost, moved enough air to actually be operated as the starter for a jet engine on a plane. So it developed that much volume to shove into the engine. Now, there are actually examples of these auxiliary superchargers that people still own. Never seen one used, but I have seen, and you can find them too. If you Google up Turbonique Auxiliary Supercharger, you can find them in pieces. People have complete versions of them. They look like a kind of a, a medieval-looking turbo with a spark plug jabbed in it. And that spark plug would, again, ignite the rocket fuel, and this thing would spin up to a, about 100,000 RPM, according to Gene Middlebrooks. And as it was doing that, would be shoving air into the engine Independent of independent of the engine working itself. So again, you have two different systems going on here, and there is no record of one of these actually doing anything important on a race car or a street car. There is video footage of one being used on a street car, but we never actually see it employed. We see the guy bolt the thing in, we see him unbolt the carburetor, and bolt the supercharger onto the intake manifold where the carburetor was because the supercharger had its own independent draw-through carburetor that it would use. So we see that all happen, and we see the car drive down the street in this video, but we never actually see the supercharger employed. Now you might be wondering, what would something like this even sound like? Because obviously if it's a little miniature kind of uh, rocket turbine under your hood, it would probably make noise. Well, thanks to the miracle of modern technology, we can now listen to exactly what it would have sounded like, and this is beyond comprehension. The next test you're about to hear is that of a turbinique auxiliary powered supercharger. The supercharger was set up and operated independent of a reciprocating engine. The supercharger's intake manifold was equipped with two Stromberg 97 carburetors. Both carburetors were set with their throttles in the open position. In order to demonstrate the charge's instant response capability on the maximum compressor load, the compressor discharge was not restricted. This allows the compressor to do the maximum amount of work. The turbo compressor's acceleration will naturally be greater under any other conditions of compressor loading. The supercharger test follows. <laughs> 
So there's that. It sounds like you have a, a, a insane air raid siren under the hood of your car. And as we heard the narrator say, and I'm not sure if that's Gene Middlebrook's voice or not, or if it's a paid narrator. Either way, what we heard the narrator describe was the fact that the this, this supercharger at its inlet had two Stromberg 97 carburetors that were pinned wide open just like someone would be driving wide open throttle. And the back of that supercharger was attached to nothing. It wasn't trying to feed an engine. And so what you got there is the instant spool up. There was no resistance behind the supercharger to get it all the way up to speed. I wouldn't imagine there would be much delay if there was an engine behind it, other than the fact that it would be an instant bottleneck. If you had this thing on a on a flathead, if you had it on any sort of even just normal small block back in the day, um, it, it, I can't even begin to imagine, one, how much boost it would make, two, how you would keep head gaskets in any engine that this thing was on, or three, how long it would last. Oh, by the way, how long it would last? In the company literature, it said that you should never use this supercharger for more than about five minutes at a time. Granted, I don't know how big the fuel tank that we would use what was called thermaline fuel would last you. But to be on the button for this thing for five minutes, I think uh, two and a half minutes or even 15 seconds might be a little <laughs> might be a little bit of a stretch. So the Turbonique auxiliary powered supercharger was crazy, but certainly was not the craziest thing that Gene Middlebrooks had conceived. That honor goes to a device called the Turbonique Rocket Drag Axle. And before we talk about exactly what this thing was, let's listen to what it sounded like. Since most persons are not familiar with the operating sounds of such unconventional engines, their recorded sounds are presented on this record for the convenience of prospective customers. The first engine noises to be presented are those of a Model 2 microturbo gas turbine engine. The test engine was set up for operation on Turbonique's Crony brake absorption dynamometer. The engine was started under complete stall condition. After a few seconds of stalled operation, brake pressure was reduced on the dynamometer to allow the turbine to rotate. The turbine whine can be heard as its speed is changed over the operating speed range. The engine run was terminated with dynamometer brake pressure applied. Thus, the coast down is rather abrupt. The turbine test follows. So that is the sound of a Turbonique rocket drag axle, effectively what that unit was operating on what the narrator describes as a prony brake dyno or a dynamometer. So what this device was, I need you to kind of put your thinking cap on, your visualization cap on here. And what it is is a rocket that is a kind of a self-contained unit within the rear axle of a car. So these units were rated anywhere between 850 horsepower all the way up to 1300 horsepower. And the way this would work is you could drive your car around on the normal engine all you wanted. The normal engine's up front. You could cruise around town, do whatever you want. But then when you want to go to the racetrack, when you actually want to go race it, you would bring the car to the starting line. You would place the engine in neutral and then you would hit a button and that button would ignite the rocket underneath attached to the rear axle. That rocket's thrust would spin a wheel, which would then drive the gears in the rear end. So you had a wheel-driven, rocket-powered version of your streetcar going down the racetrack with about as much horsepower as what a top fuel dragster would have had in the mid-1960s. If this sounds like complete lunacy, it was. It used the same fuel called thermaline, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, as the auxiliary supercharger did and as the thrust rocket engines did, which we'll also talk about in a few minutes. So the rocket drag axle is what really kind of pushed Turbonique to fame because they advertised this a lot. And the rocket drag axle, unlike the auxiliary supercharger, which I have never ever seen on anything functioning, was very well used. It was it was famously used around the country by a handful of race cars. If you listen to the Captain Jack McClure version of the Dorkomotive podcast, you heard me talk about the Sizzler, which was a Chevelle that he drove, which had a Turbonique rocket drag axle in it that ran like 160 miles an hour, which was just astonishing for a full-size car back then. And uh, that ended up uh, crashing horribly. 
after it basically melted the rear end together with the heat from the rocket engine after, you know, about half a year of running it. The rear end failed, and, and boom, uh, Jack McClure rolled 15 times or 12 times, ended up walking away, but that was uh, one sad story. There was another guy that had one of these mounted in a dragster called the U.S. Turbine 1 that raced uh, with some frequency out on the West Coast, and, and back in the day, there was really nowhere to classify this, so he, they would go to open match race top fuel shows and try to qualify this car, and you can find the U.S. Turbine 1 dragster uh, on YouTube. A guy named George, the Stone Age man, Hutchison drove this car, and it's cool because he used to put this very tall, like three-foot-tall plume like a roman soldier in his helmet and he'd be going down the track and the plume would be blowing in the air kind of a neat piece of showmanship there a guy in new hampshire named joe mazza had one of these in the back of a dragster and that dragster was recently discovered so joe mazza's turbo neek dragster is complete one of the very few turbo neek related cars that are complete anymore in the world it does not function anymore but it does show up at car shows from time and time again You can go see that. Perhaps most famously, though, there was a Volkswagen Bug that had a Turbonic rocket drag axle in the back of it. And the name of that bug, or I should say the the name of the bug was the Black Widow. And the Black Widow would go and it would actually match race vehicles like TV Tommy Ivo's four-engine showboat dragster. So this was a car that... um, was astonishing in the fact that it was a Volkswagen doing what it did. It would run single digit elapsed times and it, like so many other turbo neat powered vehicles met an untimely fate. The driver of the car was a black man from Kansas city named Roy drew. And he raced under the name, Mr. Pitiful. There was a popular Otis Redding song on the radio in the 1960s named Mr. Pitiful. So that's what kind of, he took as his stage name. Anyway, he has a Volkswagen beetle stock body beetle, literally front to tail it is painted black as you'd expect for the black widow name has uh, some kind of wheelie bars on the back of it because of what this thing wanted to and ultimately did so anyway with the turbonic rocket drag axle powering this with the fuel tanks in the front droy drew i should say is at tampa drag strip sets a track record at 9.36 seconds 168 miles an hour in a stock bodied volkswagen All is well. Everybody's happy. They're slapping fives. Drew goes back out on the racetrack, and at 183 miles an hour, the Volkswagen literally takes flight. It takes flight. It crashes to the earth. It rolls over, you know, a half a million times or whatever it happened to be. And so Drew thankfully survives this wreck. And then Turbonique and Gene Middlebrooks in his ultimate wisdom use a still photo of Drew standing next to his completely annihilated race car and kind of uses that in their advertising. And it is an incredible visual. That is uh, 100% for sure. Um, It also is an incredible testament to the fact that that these things did actually do what they said they were going to do in terms of the power making potential um, and ability to get down the racetrack. Again, reliability is a problem as anything you'd expect creating this amount of heat and creating this amount of rpm in a rear axle it's a scary thing to think about what's actually happening underneath the trunk lid of that car or underneath the trunk floor of that car as this turbo neat rocket drag axle is working another notable car called the pegasus is a mustang that ran a turbo neat rocket drag axle it was a fairly popular um exhibition car you can find photos of this car racing at events like the ahra winter nationals and others so you know turbonique cars did in fact exist they did work so none of this is made up it all sounds completely fake and made up because of just how insane the idea of all this is behind it and if even another element of craziness is that in the literature What they recommended you did was you went and got a three-quarter ton or one ton rear axle from a Ford truck or a Studebaker truck to use as the basis of where you're going to mount this Turbonique rocket drag axle. So they wanted you to use that big full-floating truck axle because of just how brutal this thing was. There was no throttle for this. You were either on the button, the rocket was firing, and you were going down the racetrack, or you were off the button, and nothing was happening. So there was no easing in to the Turbonique rocket drag axle. You hit the button and held on for dear life, and you prayed that your car stayed on the ground, and you prayed that the rocket drag axle didn't fly apart. Now, if the rocket drag axle was the craziest thing that Turbonique made, 
maybe the most dangerous thing they made was their thrust engines. And once again, to really get into what this thrust engine stuff sounds like and how this thrust engine stuff worked, let's give a listen to that 1960s record that gives us the sounds of Turbonique. Turbonique's thrust engines, which will be heard next, create the greatest amount of noise during operation. The noise level of the thrust engine is significantly reduced when the engine is utilized in conjunction with a thrust augmenting ejector. This test, however, does not utilize an ejector. A Model 12T thrust engine will be heard operating on Turbonique's static thrust measuring stand. Its high velocity exhaust jet discharges directly into the still surrounding air. The thrust engine test follows. So that's pretty standard issue sounding rocket stuff, right? You kind of just hear the whoosh of the of the thrust coming out of the back of the thrust tubes or the the thrust nozzle as one would uh, one would perhaps describe it. Um, these engines were the simplest thing that were made by Turbonique. They were the cheapest thing that were made by Turbonique. And they were probably the least powerful thing made by Turbonique. But the design here, the idea here was you could put them on snowmobiles. You could put them on mini bikes. You could put them on uh, go-karts, of course, is where they became perhaps most popular. And the reason that I mentioned these being the most dangerous products that Turbonique made goes back to that fuel. The fuel that Gene Middlebrooks marketed as thermaline. The problem was with thermaline and the problem with these particular engines is if you happen to get on and off the throttle of a Turbonique thrust engine it wouldn't burp it wouldn't hiccup it would explode because the fuel would puddle up and then when you got back on the button that spark plug would fire the spark plug that was igniting that very volatile fuel and you would have a major league problem on your hands, especially if you're on a go-kart and this thing was sitting just, I don't know, six, eight inches behind your head. Now, some interesting proof of this is in the next audio you're going to hear, which comes from a video of Captain Jack McClure running his rocket go-kart in the early 1960s at Tampa Dragway in Florida. I want you to listen very carefully about what the announcer says as Captain Jack McClure is about to make his run, and we'll go into the importance of those words after you hear them. Fastest go kart here in lane one. Up and back out of the way just in case this thing ignites like it did one afternoon out here. And ready to go now on the sideline. Ready to blast off. So you won't. So you heard the announcer say that he wanted to back away from it in case it ignites like it did one afternoon out here. And one of the most interesting things about Turbonique and about its history is the fact that there is actually a fair amount of misinformation out there regarding what happened with a lot of these products. And this is where we're going to get into first the fuel that was used. We're going to explain that a little bit because of uh, its complete insanity. But we're also at this moment want to touch on a couple of things in terms of people being killed by these things exploding or people dying because of these things blowing up. There is not one case documented that I could find, and I have done extensive research on this subject, and it's alluded to in a lot of different stories that, um, that people were killed by these things blowing up and that people were maimed by explosions and all kinds of other stuff. But the reality is there is not one news story, there is not one drag racing tall tale that can be proven that shows that anybody was actually killed directly by a turbo a turbonique product. Now again, that's not really a ringing endorsement. I'm not saying this stuff was good. I mean, it was good. It was great. I mean, you think about the incredible nature of these things he was trying to sell. But I think one thing that needs to be clear when you learn about the history of turbonique is the fact that no one actually died because of a failure of the unit. Sure, people got into wrecks. The Volkswagen didn't crash because the Turbonique failed. It crashed because it was traveling at roughly five times the speed that a Volkswagen was actually ever proven to go when it was stock. Aerodynamics took care of the problem with the Volkswagen, not the Turbonique unit. 
The Pegasus car ran forever. The U.S. Turbine 1 ran forever. Joe Mazza's dragster, as I mentioned, is still intact. The Rocket go-karts that did exist were not that populous. Captain Jack McClure was the most famous before he switched over to a hydrogen peroxide rocket cart. But there were several others around the country. And there is no case other than people that don't really know a lot about the history of this company saying that others were killed because of the failure of the product. Now, the announcer's words do give us a cautionary tale. He does say he's moving away in case, in my opinion, he's alluding to the fact that this rocket go-kart that Jack McClure has has at least once blown up. Um, And I don't think he'd be saying the things he said if he didn't witness it with his own two eyes. So that is an interesting uh, that is an interesting thing to hear somebody actually say out loud. But again, in terms of fatalities, in terms of people being you know irreparably harmed by a Turbonique rocket, anything or a Turbonique thrust engine or a Turbonique, you name it, there really aren't any that we can prove. Now about that fuel, Gene Middlebrooks called it thermaline. Science calls it something else. To start the engine, fuel is simply injected into the combustion chamber and ignited. Ignition can be accomplished in the absence of oxygen by using a high-energy blow plug. However, Turbinique prefers the more reliable and quicker starting resulting from an oxygen assist spark ignition system. With this system, oxygen is applied to the combustion chamber for only a fraction of a second each time the turbine is started. Once started, the engine will continue to run without further oxygen or air. This ability makes it technically feasible to operate such engines underwater or in the voids of space. Now, it totally makes sense that a guy like Gene Middlebrooks, who made his living as a rocket engineer, would choose this fuel that he called thermaline for marketing purposes uh, for Turbonique as the actual fuel for these rockets and the rocket drag axle and the auxiliary supercharger. So what thermaline actually was, was N-propyl nitrate, which, as you would expect, is rocket fuel. And the last line in that clip I just played you is the most telling part, that it would operate in the void of space, because what was he doing? He was working for NASA and other government contractors to develop rockets and develop ways for us to launch people uh, into space, to launch missiles into space. So he was very familiar with all these different fuels. Apparently his specialty was solid fuels, but liquid fuels um, with the same properties, obviously he knows them pretty well. So let's talk about its cost first off. If we go off of the 1969 pricing for thermaline, which is about 350 a gallon, and he would sell it to you, through the mail, that's 25 bucks a gallon today. So this was not a cheap um, uh, fuel to buy. And the fact that this stuff was shipped through the mail and the fact that anyone could buy it at their home is the most, probably the most mental part of this whole thing. This is really mean stuff. And despite what he says or what we hear in this audio clip and the audio clips I've been playing for you, This stuff is no joke. Um, Thermaline and or propyl nitrate, if it contacts water and then contacts like ferrous metal, like steel, it'll explode. Uh, It is unstable. It is not shelf happy. It does not age well. It will combust uh, under pressure. It It will do all the kinds of things that nitromethane does that we talk about in drag racing, but it'll even do those at kind of a worse rate. Being a monopropellant, nitromethane at least needs oxygen to ignite. And normal N-propyl nitrate doesn't need anything. It literally doesn't need anything to ignite. My understanding is, and from what I've read um, on the data sheets about this, it is kind of a milky white looking liquid. Um, It is not something that anybody recommends you have near you, around you, uh, within... 50 feet of you it is a pretty amazing thing when you start to read about the fuel and you read about really what n-propyl nitrate is and the data sheets and all the other things that surround this stuff i mean it's bad news they don't even use it as rocket fuel anymore it's probably so toxic they don't even want to have it around rockets and or rocketry so the fact that again you could 
have your local mailman, postal carrier, lug a one-gallon jug of this stuff, a pail, and plunk it, quite literally plunk it on your front doorstep, is absolutely crazy. And as we've heard in that last um, clip, it needs, you know, they would they would recommend introducing just a little oxygen, and then once you got the party started, it was all over with. So the way that those rocket engines work, the thrust engines, is very simple. It's just pressurized fuel in there, and you lit it off and held on for dear life. Again, very basic principles here, but just insane that they were available to the general public. Um, if if thermaline would come into contact with rubber or plastic, um, it would just melt it instantaneously, like liquefy it. Nitrous oxide is a kind of very, uh, let's call it a stable, um, a, a safe, if you will, monopropellant. You know, nitrous oxide, because it has oxygen in it, that's the secret of it making a lot of, helping to make a lot of horsepower and internal combustion engines, because when you heat it up to about 600 degrees, the molecules split open, releasing the oxygen, the oxygen comes out, you can introduce more fuel, and now you have an engine that makes a lot more horsepower. But nitrous oxide it doesn't explode at will, doesn't degrade sitting on the shelf, and certainly if you have, if it comes into contact with rubber or metal or anything else, doesn't have any sort of... Um, really kind of negative reaction. So I've mentioned the mail a few times. I've mentioned the price of things a few times. And we really need now to get into the downfall of Gene Middlebrooks, the downfall of Turbonique, and how he found himself being prosecuted by federal authorities for making the most insane hot rod parts of all time. We need to talk about price. So thermaline fuel we mentioned, 350 a gallon in 1969, equates to $25 a gallon today. It is hard to find exact pricing for the auxiliary supercharger and for the thrust engines, but it is not difficult to find pricing for the rocket drag axle. And Gene Middlebrooks sold the rocket drag axle at three different price points. The first one was $2,430. This is in 1968 money. And this was for basically raw castings that you had to finish yourself. Now, he would say in the advertising that these could be finished by with simple hand tools. Anybody with some mechanical gumption and some smarts could buy this kit, and they would be able to finish the product, and they would be able to have it under their car for the cheapest amount of $2430. That is the equivalent of $18,420 today. So then you can move up to the next level of finishment, $3,225, you got a little bit more machine work done by Turboni. You got a fairly more complete product, and it came with the axle that you could also assemble with it. So basically, you, resp you were responsible for providing your own hardware. You were responsible for building the axle, but all the pieces were there, and it required a little bit of work to finish it. That $3,225 is equal to $24,446 today. And finally, the most expensive way to buy this thing was a factory-built, complete, ready-to-install unit. And I would argue that any of the race cars that we saw in the 1960s with Turbonique axles had them completely built by Gene Middlebrooks and the Turbonique factory, and they were delivered complete. And I'll tell you why in a couple of minutes. But for the full, complete, 100% turnkey slash hit button, have rocket axle satisfaction unit, $4,695, which is the equivalent of $35,589 in today's money. But what does that mean in comparison to something in that 1968-1969 time frame? So I gave you the 68 pricing for Turbonique. The most expensive is uh, $4,695. Just a year later, you could buy a Boss 429 Mustang, the baddest of the bad. Boss 429 engine, the works for a price of $4,798. So for $100 more than a Turbonique rocket drag axle, you could buy a complete brand new Boss 429 Mustang. That is part of the problem Gene Middlebrooks begins to run into with his products, is that they are incredibly expensive. The other part of the problem that Gene Middlebrooks begins to have is an old foe of his known as mail fraud. As we go back about 10 years to that 1958 time frame when he was building those quote-unquote electric superchargers that never really worked or no one ever really got, we start to see a familiar pattern emerge here for Turbonique. Yes, he's done the marketing. 
Yes, he spent the money. Yes, he has products out there being shown in front of thousands of people at drag strips every weekend across America. And yes, he has orders coming in. But Gene Middlebrooks has a problem. He doesn't have product going out. As so often happens in cases like this with kind of a wild product and perhaps even a wilder entrepreneur behind the product, uh, things get weird. And it seems as though Gene Middlebrooks maybe fell into the same trap that so many other entrepreneurs have fallen into over the years where they are using the orders they're receiving as seed money to fill the orders they have already received. And that is not good business. That is kind of like a pyramid scheme that is genuinely and generally uh, going to fail and fail in spectacular fashion. So in 19, late 1968, early 69, Middlebrooks is brought into federal court and he faces a 21 count indictment uh, for various violations of federal law, most of them surrounding the use of the mail to sell a product that doesn't really exist in the former fashion you're trying to sell it in. So the jury found Middlebrooks guilty on 16 counts, found him not guilty on three counts, and the feds dismissed the other two counts or the other count in the indictment. Uh, The trial judge sentenced him to two years imprisonment, fined him $4,000 on the eight counts that he was convicted on. Now, he was given a suspended sentence and probation for five years, and basically um, he was told, listen, man, like, don't do this again. This is effectively the third time you've been busted for this, second, third time you've been busted for this since 1958. So you do it again, you're going to go in for some time. Reading the court documents is pretty fascinating because it really sums up the problem that Gene Middlebrooks ran into. So if I can read from this document from August 20th, 1970, this is as part of a um, appeal that Gene Middlebrooks had filed against the government. The defendant designed, manufactured, and sold to the United States mail supercharger and turbine kits that were virtually impossible for the average mechanic to assemble. These kits rarely contained more than six rough metal castings, although pictures of the kits in various magazines usually usually showed 10 to 12 parts. Turbine catalog said can be easily installed with the use of small basic machine and hand tools. Testimony at the trial revealed that a 16-inch lathe, drill press, and precision balancing equipment were necessary tools for assembling the Turbine model C2C supercharger. Perhaps a person with the defendant's eccentric genius for mechanical engineering might be able to take the raw materials and make them operable by adding an ignition system, fuel tank, plumbing fixtures, valves, and bearings, but this was well beyond the capability of the ordinary mortal. The expense of the extra machinery, of necessary skilled craftsmen, of special fuel, and of additional parts added up to about five to $900 beyond the purchase price of about $100 to 150 Middlebrooks must have known this. Continuing, the brochures and form letters the defendant used to sell his product offered supercharger casting kits at so-called 50% dealer discounts and also offered a distributorship for Turbonique products. Every purchaser was offered one of the discount and a distributorship. Turbonique sent form letters to prospective customers stating that, quote, your name was mentioned at a sales meeting with regard to an exclusive Turbonique dealership in Lapeer County. Quote, the only salesman employed at Turbonique was the defendant. And there's actually a really cool version of this letter that Middlebrooks would send out. So if you if you wrote to Gene Middlebrooks and said, hey, I'm interested in maybe buying a Turbonique unit of any sort of fashion, you would get this response. Now, this response, this letter, when it was sent to a man named Matthew Nichols on January 27th, 1965, after Mr. Nichols had inquired about buying a Turbonique unit. Middlebrooks writes, As you might suspect, our supercharger and turbines have created quite a bit of excitement in Pennsylvania. From the volume of mail we're receiving from Pennsburg, it appears that we could benefit by establishing a dealership in your area. We propose supplying you with an auxiliary-powered supercharger for your present automobile at a special demonstrator discount of 50% off. In return for this, we ask you to install the supercharger, place our Turbonique supercharge decal on your windshield, and run your automobile at the local drag strips. If, in addition to this demonstration of the equipment, on a no-obligation basis you would like to consider sales, we are prepared to appoint you as our distributor and refer inquiries to you for follow-up. We can extend a 50% discount to you on any equipment you order for your customers. 
If you wish to accept our offer, fill in the attached form and return it with your deposit for our prompt action. Your demonstrator equipment will be shipped promptly via Railway Express. All that sounds pretty good, right? The guy's going to make you a dealer if you buy one of his blowers, buy a supercharger, become a dealer. Well, again, pyramid scheme. You're going to be a dealer for a product that he can't manufacture and can't really even sell. Another from the 1970 appeal that was rejected by the federal government. Quote, All Turbonique supercharger and turbine kits were shipped COD, so that the buyer was required to pay before inspecting the merchandise received. Middlebrooks would then have his money, and the purchaser would have nothing of value unless he were willing to expend additional sums of money to make an operable unit. In the final analysis, a buyer of one of these kits would either be stuck with something valueless to him and change off the transaction to experience, or he would have to engage in a series of progressively more expensive purchases to assemble and make operable the initial purchase of rough metal castings. Once a Turbine customer had parted with his money, there was no hope of him retaining, no hope of him obtaining a refund. Return shipments were authorized only for exchange and as credit towards the purchase of more expensive supercharger models. We continue. The record shows that the scheme to defraud, for which the mails were an essential element, were premised on half-truths, subtle concealment of material facts, and patent falsehoods. Instead of a product easily installed, a purchaser acquired a few parts, which were then, with the addition of other parts, and the skills of an electrician, plumber, and machinist just might have one day become an operable supercharger. Now, what's really interesting here is the fact that during his trial, Middlebrooks chose to be his own lawyer. And this is where we get to see kind of who Gene Middlebrooks maybe really is, because this was um, this was not a great decision, and it's a decision that uh, the judge uh, did not agree with, and it's something that uh, is pretty funny. So we read from the 1972 appeal that Gene Middlebrooks lost, and we go back to the initial court trial. We begin. It appears that Middlebrooks was engaged in 1968 in the manufacture and sale of automotive turbine and supercharger kits. In that capacity, he was investigated and indicted on 21 counts of mail fraud. At a hearing held prior to the 1968 trial and at the trial himself, Middlebrooks emphatically waived his right to counsel, stating at both times that he preferred to argue his own case. To compress the facts of that trial, Middlebrooks alleged harassment by the post office, lost, and was convicted and sentenced on 16 counts of the indictment. Having failed on in his direct appeals and exhausted his motions to extend time prior to the commencement of sentence, Middlebrooks entered federal custody and immediately filed this Section 2255 proceeding, which was yet another appeal. This is another great passage from the judge in that 1972 case where he says, Middlebrooks had apparently been indicted and acquitted of a similar charge in 1958. It appears from the record that he took the opportunity of this second indictment in 1968 to vent his spleen at the post office. He rejected the district court's proffer of counsel on two separate occasions because he felt that he could get the best, quote, licks in at the post office personally without the assistance of counsel. Whatever its wisdom... This is a reasonable exercise of Middlebrook's freedom of choice. For his decision, Middlebrook's can perhaps be faulted with poor judgment, but the trial judge on that evidence alone cannot be faulted for failing to remind Middlebrook's quite adequately that he would be better advised to accept counsel. Rather, the trial judge in 1968 conducted a thorough inquiry into Middlebrook's intentions and capacities. This is important because the hinge point on Middlebrook's appeals were the fact that he was, well, crazy during his initial trial. He said that he was incapable of representing himself, that the judge should have known that, and that the judge, by allowing him to represent himself, uh, failed him and therefore should have a mistrial. He claimed that he was suffering from hypomania, which if you look up hypomania, it basically is a very generic um, explanation for craziness. The refunds were his biggest problem, and the fact that he never gave anybody any money back. So when they sent him money for a product, he never sent them what they ordered, what they thought they were getting. And then when they complained, no one ever got the money back. And so Middlebrooks then attempted to basically throw his secretary under the bus 
a woman named Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick has to testify at the trial. And this is, again, looking at Mr. Middlebrook's character, this is speaking to exactly what we're talking about. And we quote from the judge. Although the defense, defendant's secretary, Ms. Kilpatrick, did not testify she was the custodian of a certain group of records referred to as the quote-unquote refund ledger, nor that such records are kept in the ordinary course of business, nor when the transaction contained in such a ledger were recorded, the defendant attempted to introduce this record through Mrs. Kilpatrick. An examination of what the defendant described as the refund ledger revealed that checks were issued in many instances without any notation as to what they represented, and many of the ent entries merely reflected credit exchanges rather than refunds. A characterization of this hodgepodge of unauthenticated records as a refund ledger was a self-serving characterization with no basis in fact. In the case at the bar, the defendant offered no live testimony by witnesses who dealt with Turbonique and received refunds. End quote. The big problem here is the fact that the government did have people that got screwed over by Gene Middlebrooks that did not get refunds that sat on the bench or that sat on the witness stand and buried him with testimony. So Middlebrooks does have to spend two years in prison. He is released early, or I should say he's released at the end of the two years, has to serve his remaining time on probation. And what happens to Gene Middlebrooks? Obviously his legacy is this Turbo Neat company, but what happens to the guy that created this stuff, that marketed this stuff, and well, ultimately went to prison for trying to sell it and failing to do just that? Everything points to the fact that Gene Middlebrooks ended up as an owner of a small resort in Florida. He apparently never left the state of Florida in terms of his permanent residence after all this Turbonique business went down. The interesting thing is Gene Middlebrooks found himself in the newspapers while he was the owner of that resort due to a groundwater dispute he was having with the city the resort was located in. And it was a battle that ultimately he lost there as well. And they were fighting over the rights to groundwater and wells and how much volume his wells could flow. And he said that they weren't wells, that they were natural springs. And it became a very Gene Middlebrooks tile situation, one that he had found himself in many times before. And of course, it ended up in court, this time not federal court, of course, but uh, local state court, which he got trounced in. So there you have it. That is the unabridged story of Gene Middlebrooks and the Turbonique Company. One last note on Turbonique. Middlebrooks had probably the coolest slogan tagline of any company of the 1960s. It was long-winded, much like we expect Gene Middlebrooks was, especially when you read about those court documents with him representing himself and disparaging people and making insane comments to the court. But when he came up with the slogan for Turbonique, he definitely was employing his vast experience as a rocket engineer. The slogan? Turbonique. Expanded civilian consumer benefits through economical applications of space-age technology. That space-age technology was thermaline, it was rockets, and it was their use in hot rotting. Turbonique's legend grew, looms large over the internet. You can read a lot about it. You can see photos and video of everything I've talked about here today. Go on YouTube or hit Google up and just start typing in Turbonique and you'll get the story and the sounds and even more to see about this really, truly crazy company and the guy who is flirting with his own sanity to run it. We'll be back with more Dorkomotive next time. We'll be diving into more cool historical topics, taking you to places you've never heard about, and telling you about things maybe you never knew existed. We're going to send you off today with the sounds of Captain Jack McClure at Tampa Dragway in 1964, heading down the racetrack in his Turbonique rocket-powered go-kart. Somewhere, Gene Middlebrooks is smiling.